Welcome to the Point of No Return podcast, a show at the intersection of technology and strategy. On this show, we interview industry leaders and experts to better understand how they think about strategy during this time of exponential progress. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Point of No Return podcast. On today's show, we spoke with Jafar Awanati, co-founder and COO of Lupio. Jafar is based in Toronto, where he started his company, and we had a really great conversation about entrepreneurship, about how he started uh, Lupio with his two co-founders, uh, maybe a little bit about his background. Uh, before venturing into tech entrepreneurship, Jafar started his career as a mechanical engineer uh, on some really interesting projects like a multi-billion dollar nickel mine in Madagascar to advising the government of Dubai on how to build green buildings on palm-shaped islands. Jafar's passion for business eventually led him to the Kellogg School of Management to pursue his MBA with a concentration in entrepreneurship, marketing, and strategy. After Kellogg, he joined Deloitte in Chicago as a senior consultant with a focus on marketing and sales channel strategy. While building out the digital strategy practice within Deloitte's innovation center, Jafar caught the technology bug and in early 2014, co-founded Lupio with two co-founders, Zach and Matt. Lupio is a SaaS platform that helps enterprises supercharge their response process for RFPs, RFIs, and security questionnaires. On the show, we spoke about how he decided to jump from the world of consulting to, to tech entrepreneurship, uh, so leaving a kind of very safe place uh, and uh, have, have a little bit of similarities with that move, the importance of a strong founding team over an idea, uh, which I found I resonated with as well. Uh, how focusing on the customer has helped Lupio to scale to over 50 employees and hundreds of customers. And we also spoke about Lupio's strategic planning process and how they conduct monthly offsites, which I found very interesting as well. Jafar is a natural entrepreneur. He's built a very impressive tech startup, all without funding, and he was very generous with his insights. I hope that you enjoy the show. Jafar, thanks for being on the show. More than happy to be here. Thanks so much. I think you're officially the first guest I have from Toronto, so I'm very happy that you took the time and we're yeah. doing this remote today. All right, that's um, my time. <laughs> and, uh, I've been hearing a lot of good things about uh, about your company, about what you guys are doing. But before we talk about uh, Lupio, maybe ask you a, a personal question and sure. uh, ask you why you decided to leave a quote-unquote safe career, as I'm sure a lot of people kind of told you, in consulting yeah. to start your own company. Uh, I think for me, I, I always was interested in um, starting my own business. And, and I sort of remember it even when I was uh, in my undergrad. And funny enough, these are conversations that I was having with my now co-founder, Zach, back when I was 18. And we would you know sit around the student center and sort of say that, yeah, one day we're going to start a company together. Um, but it's funny that it took um, pretty much 10 years or more before we actually made that happen. Um, so there's always been an interest in, in entrepreneurship um, from taking technical entrepreneurship classes in engineering to when I was working in industry. Um, but for me, the thing that really accelerated it was um, during my MBA, actually one of my majors was entrepreneurship. And I remember when writing my sort of application essays to business school, uh, one of the things that I wrote about the particular program I was in was the fact that I think it was like 80% of all entrepreneurship majors from that program ended up pursuing entrepreneurship in some way, whether they worked at a startup or started a company uh, within five years of graduating. So I, I, that was something that I referred to even beforehand. So I think for me, consulting was always a stepping stone or a launching pad to really build up my business acumen. Uh, but I always knew that I wanted to start something. I just didn't know what it would be. That's interesting. Do you feel that the entrepreneurship program gave you the seeds to want to do something? Or do you believe that you already had a little bit of that drive, a little bit of that motivation before? I think I, I always had the motivation to do something. Um, it's just really interesting to go through a program where you end up you know, looking at business strategy and go to market and building a business plan and all that. It's, it is exciting when you're sort of get to test those kinds of ideas. But the reality is, 
you know, whatever education that you want to take is not necessarily going to set you up or get you ready to what it's like to start a company. It's just, uh, it just continues to add fuel to the fire, I would say, in terms of building excitement. Hmm, that's great. And I imagine that even though you had a relatively short career in consulting at Deloitte, mm-hmm. uh, did that year and a half uh, help prepare you in any way? Were there any lessons from working in management consulting that are applicable to, to starting a, a tech startup? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's uh, there are a lot of elements of consulting that are very much only applicable to sort of large industry. And and even that even applies to business school. You can pursue your MBA and a lot of the things that you study and you focus on are on market dynamics uh, between very large organizations. Even things around pricing strategy or things like marketing strategy tend to be focused on larger enterprises. Um, but I think the stuff that I learned from consulting was um, just elements around structure, I think, are extremely important. Just how you can look at a problem and segment it, organize it and use data in order to help drive decisions. And even things like structuring a meeting, how you can manage and grow a productive team of really smart people as well. Uh, It's a very feedback-oriented industry, and just even project performance. All of those elements, I think, are really interesting um, that really apply to how you want to structure and and grow a business. Um, I think there are a lot of transferable skills from many industries. Uh, Consulting is one of those areas where you work a, a ridiculous number of hours for very um, high demanding clients on very challenging problems. And I think just having that sort of pace of work is almost like boot camp to what the expectations are in the early stages of starting a company. I can imagine, right? So it, <laughs> you were, like, I guess, a little bit of sadism of like, hey, I'm going to leave working in like an 80 hour work week job to starting a startup from scratch. And I believe you were uh, a co-founder as well at Lupio. Mm-hmm. What, what was the idea behind Lupio? How did you guys come up with that idea? And like, I imagine that maybe the idea changed or, or did not. Uh, so I'd like to hear about a little bit about the inception story. Yeah, I, mean, I first want to comment on what you're saying in terms of like working an 80 hour job to starting a company. I think what's really interesting is uh, for starting a company, it is a lot of work. But I think the thing that's really unique is at a startup, especially when you're a founder, you have the ability to build your own boundaries. So even if you do work a ton of hours, you have the ability to say, okay, it's 6 p.m. I'm going to stop. I'm going to go out and grab dinner with my friends or I'm going to stop and I'm going to go to the gym. Uh, and these are things that you may not necessarily have the flexibility to do in a consulting or an investment banking context. Um, but you still work a ton, but you still have a lot of control, which actually allows you to provide still some element of balance. So even with all the work and starting a company, I still felt like my life was very much um, sort of balanced between all the different facets that were important for me in my life. So I think that's a really important point. And I think a lot of times people talk about entrepreneurship and the grind. Um, but the, I think the grind does come with some control. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely with that point. And, you know, it's funny cause I feel sometimes the reverse to be tough as well. So I, you know, the ability to set your own boundaries and freedom, I think is incredible, which is kind of the reason why I wanted to launch start my own thing. Yeah. But then I'm, I always feel this in- intense sense of remorse that I'm not working enough. And yeah. I think I've gotten better at it. Um, mm-hmm. but particularly in the early days where the business wasn't going as well, uh, it was really hard to go and, you know, get, get clients. Yeah. And sometimes it just, there wasn't enough stuff to do. So I'm like, okay, it's Saturday, 3 PM. Should I just go out and enjoy a nice July day or like just like be depressed and say, ah, oh, my business is not working and it's not going well. And I should like either read or prepare a, like an article or just try and do something. Yeah. And uh, it's a fine balance between, uh, between those those two things i find because yeah. in one sense that drive is also what helps you kind of like be restless and yeah. build a business yeah. but you can't be it can't be a, a an anchor around you either right and i've gotten better at that balance but it's not always been easy yeah i think the interesting thing is as an employee um you can have an unproductive day but then you know that you're going to get your paycheck at the end of the month or at the end of the week versus in the early days of entrepreneurship when salary is a different conversation it's sort of you know that if you didn't have a productive day and you didn't close x number of clients that that impacts your viability or your livelihood 
uh, in the early stages of a company. Obviously, in the beginning, you as an individual contributor, as an entrepreneur, you have far more impact. But as you grow, as your business grows, um, you end up realizing that it's not about what you do and the hours that you're putting in, but rather how do you empower your team to do the best work possible in order to evolve and grow your business. So your activities and what you do as an entrepreneur shifts quite tremendously as the company evolves. Um, but I do want to go back to your original question in terms of the idea and how sort of Lupio came about a, as, as a business. Um, and and I, I want to take it back to what I mentioned around my early days at, at Queens University where I met my co-founder, Zach. So I did mention that we were both sort of 18 and talking about starting businesses. But when we decided to sort of really take this seriously and want to build something together, um, I think the really important thing is we both gained alignment that it wasn't about the idea. That it was always about us starting something together. And we had the confidence that we can build something and that even if it wasn't working, we can then pivot the idea and take it to something else. So the excitement was never about what is the thing that we're solving, but rather how we're solving it and what we're building as an organization. So we had you know, probably 30 different company ideas or business ideas from B2C to B2B. Uh, and as things evolved, our conversation went a little bit more specific to business to business solutions in more of a niche or what we consider a more um, sort of stagnant market or a market that hasn't been disrupted or something that wouldn't be considered to be as cool as other industries. Um, and that's really where we came around this idea of helping companies respond to RFPs. Hmm. So an RFP being a request for proposal uh, is a process typically where an organization and a sales team will have to respond to this request for proposal that's typically a laundry list of requirements that can consume an organization, especially if it's a larger deal. Um, and it's a lot of answering and building content with similarly used information that's been used in the past. Um, and so we, we got stuck on this idea a little bit. We're like, this is something that we should pursue. And in particular, because uh, Zach and my third co-founder, Matt, had seen this challenge at Achievers, which is another successful tech company out of Toronto, um, and they experienced it firsthand. So Zach was a sales engineer, and as a sales engineer, he sort of was the go-to person to answer any sort of technical request that had to do with selling the Achievers platform. And he quickly started seeing the, the, sort of the same questions being asked over and over again. And it's really the idea came from Zach and the conversation that he had at Matt where they worked together at Achievers and Matt was on the technical or dev side of things. And he was now the technical person helping to answer some of these questions as well. So we've all sort of felt this pain point. And it was when we focused on this idea of RFPs that we decided that all three of us should come together. So that was sort of like a really cool thing where we had three different people in different parts of their careers where we all of a sudden had alignment in terms of we're all ready to start something and let's just do this together. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. I love that. It's obviously very analogous to like my startup as well. We're worth three. And I, mm -hmm. you mentioned something, the team, and I'm going to go back to that just because I find it so good uh, having a strong partnership. Uh, yeah. where you trust your partners and you guys are in it together no matter what. I find that that is very admirable. Um, mm -hmm. And then the idea itself is a very, I believe, very good one because it's, it's a very recurrent problem that uh, wherever there's friction, I think, lies opportunity. Um, what was your, the, the biggest challenge in the early days when you guys um, were, were, were scaling the company? What were the, some of the, the, the biggest challenges that you had to face in, in growing and scaling? I think for us, um, one of the challenges is the fact that we, um, we actually operate as a, uh, as a bootstrap company. So we never raised any funding and we really focused on sort of a sales first approach, which actually worked to our, to our advantage in a lot of ways. So the way that we did this was sort of, I was, I was the first one to, to leave uh, my career and sort of go all in. And, and for me, I'm, I'm not a technical founder. 
Uh, both Zach and Matt are computer engineers and extremely strong developers. Um, whereas for me, my, my sort of area and domain was, was business and in particular marketing. Um, so what I ended up doing was rather than thinking about just selling and being a sales guy, uh, what I ended up focusing on is really understanding the customer and the customer experience when it comes to responding to RFPs. So rather than selling, all I did was customer interviews. And what's really interesting is conducting customer interviews in an early phase of your business is a mode of sales without necessarily being an aggressive salesperson. And um, through this, we were able to build a ton of uh, interest and get a solid foundation of really great companies to participate in a private beta. Um, I know the question that you had in terms of like, what are the challenges that we face? Um, I think for us, it was more around uh, sacrificing um, a lot of elements from our personal lives and sort of, you know, sacrificing having a job and, and taking in a salary and all those other elements um, and, and we were able to do that because of how far we were into our careers. So we were able to, to operate from a mode of being more conservative in spending and sort of living off savings. Um, but that also created a bit of a hunger in terms of, um, you know, flipping the switch and converting our sort of free beta customers and starting to ask for money sooner than later. And we were really excited to see that at one point it was, you know, I remember doing a demo or I was just about to get into a demo and uh, Zach and Matt turned to me and they were just like, Hey, why don't you ask for money at the end of this call? So why don't you, why don't we propose pricing? And uh, when we did that, um, that's where people sort of got interested and like, yeah, send me a quote. And that's sort of when things started to get a bit real. Um, but I think for, for us scaling, the biggest challenge is when you step away from three founders to bringing people on board is, is building an employer brand. How do you build an employer brand as a bootstrap company in a product and in an area like RFP software that isn't necessarily looked at as like a, a, a really exciting problem to be solved? It's a very direct pain. People know about it and... It's something that can be very easy to explain when you've been through an RFP, but to someone who's uh, young and looking to build their career, how do you actually do that? And I think we've been able to do that by sort of building an amazing culture that focuses on creating the best possible work environment for our team. Hmm. You mentioned a few interesting points, Jeff, I want to go back to, and one is, uh, this notion of customer centricity and something I've seen in preparing for, for today's conversation that you guys have mentioned this in public as well. Uh, mm -hmm. so what does it mean for Lupio to be, you know, customer centric, to have a focus on the customers? How do you make that concrete? I think the, the biggest way that we've made that concrete is by making that a point of focus from a very early stage. I think that some companies end up you end up picking what your strong suit is as an organization. You need to have a strategic focus for your business in terms of what are, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Um, you can differentiate yourself by pricing. So being extremely cheap, for example, you can differentiate yourself uh, through product, through having a very innovative product that uh, no one else can keep up with you. Uh, you can also differentiate yourself based on the experience that you provide your customers. Um, you know, we, we believe that we have a world-class product and a product that's going to continue to evolve. But the reality is product can also be duplicated. Elements or certain features can be duplicated. So we thought about what, what is something that cannot be copied? And creating a culture of uh, building trust and relationships with customers is extremely difficult to replicate, especially as you build out advocacy and customer references and relationships. So the way that we did this is Zach, who's our CEO, uh, was was really um, one of our developers <laughs> early days. It was just Zach and Matt coding. And this is when we were just three people and we ended up having a lunch meeting and he came to us and he said, uh, Jafar, Matt, um, 
I think customers are the absolute most important thing to us as an organization. I think that I should stop coding and I want to build out our customer success organization. So just think about that. You have three people. You only have two developers technically, uh, which are, you know, Zach and Matt who are, who are coding everything. And there comes a point where one of two developers says, no more coding, focus on customers. And, and through that, we've been able to build an amazing customer success organization where we've built out frameworks, structure, and just an approach that's extremely thoughtful and how we think about our customer's journey from when they become a customer to how they renew. And even if they decide to no longer be a customer, how we offboard that customer. So I think the big theme is being extremely thoughtful in terms of the experience and making someone who is even deciding to leave as a customer feel very appreciated. It's sort of uh, as an example that um, a member of our customer success team has used in the past it's sort of like you go to a restaurant and you have this amazing experience, a great welcome. You get seated at your table and you have the best meal that you've ever had in your life. And then when you ask for the check, the check takes 20 minutes to show up and they're extremely rude to you on the way out. That ruins everything. So for us, it's just thinking about that entire life cycle so that people always want to come back. Hmm. That's a great story, Jeff. I really like the... Uh the courage you took to, to make that call when you guys were still so small and still un, relatively unproven. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it, it dovetails into, into culture too. And it, you, you mentioned this, how today I believe you guys are close to 50 people, uh, yeah. and growing rapidly. And mm -hmm. I love how the customer piece ties into building a strong culture as well. Um, yeah. what do you think has been the biggest learning, uh, when it's come to building your culture? Cause I imagine you've had turnover, you've had people leave, you've been hiring, uh, I mean, interviewing a bunch of people. How mm -hmm. do you, how do you decide when someone joins Lupio and what does it take to, to, to be part of the team? I think, um, using the term culture fit isn't something that we look at in the interview process. It's, it's something that evolves naturally. And I think a lot of hiring does come with gut as well, but we have a really structured approach to how we bring people onto the team. Um, we have a uh, phone screen that's always conducted that goes through sort of interests and how they learn and how they take feedback. And then from there, if they do well on the phone screen and, and that does require for them to even have the phone screen that they need to meet a certain bar from at least our application, um, we end up conducting a ver very thorough skills interview where there's at least two people involved. And then we go into a more detailed walkthrough of their experience based on the top grade formatting of interviewing. And through each of these phases, there's um, we make sure that there's different people involved in the process. And we unbias the interviews in the sense that there's no communication in terms of what happened from one interview to the next aside from the fact that they pass to the next round. And that actually provides a lot of control in terms of how you're evaluating someone and you remove bias from the interview process in terms of bringing people on board. So I think those are all important elements from a sort of an interview perspective. But, you know, if I, if I think about culture in particular and how do you make sure that culture scales, it's just a level of awareness that culture is going to evolve and that even though the founding team may define culture at first, that the team as the team grows is going to take it and evolve it from there. But it, things break along the way and you have to be attentive to that. And I think just for us that we have a, a level of awareness that things are going to break is what allows us to make sure that we do well. Because for us, everything at the end of the day comes down to people. Your product comes down to people. Your customer experience comes down to people. Uh, being able to recruit the best talent comes down to the people that are already at your organization. And I think having that recognition that it all comes down to individuals and then how they all unite together as a team is, is what's going to make you successful. So even just as an example, um, something that we did last quarter, uh, we did a, an exercise that we uh, that's considered culture mapping. It's actually based on a, a framework by an organization called Strategizer. Um, they've done the business model uh, framework, I don't know, or the business model canvas. 
they're the ones that sort of used that framework in the past. But our um, our head of uh, people operations, and and again, you know, having a people operations team that's specifically focused on people as a strategic initiative is another important element there. But our our people ops manager Haley, she actually conducted interviews with uh, about half of the company and use the culture mapping framework to conduct those interviews to identify what is working well and what isn't working well in different facets of the organization. And all of that information was organized, structured, analyzed, and we've had multiple meetings going through this information to figure out how can we resolve these things and how can we do better. And with every resolution that we identified, we also analyzed to say what is what could go wrong and what can go right. And maybe sometimes the best decision is not changing and letting that certain element be broken temporarily. Um, so I think it, it continues to go back to uh, a thinking of being thoughtful and being aware that nothing is perfect and things should be changed. Things should change and you should be ready for change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You raised a few, a few nice pearls of wisdom, uh, Jafar, that I appreciate. So like the notion of, change in a high growth environment is 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 normal and i think to be expected okay. and i think it takes a special kind of founding team to, to lead and build a culture through that so i think that's that that's really cool um maybe to talk, switch gears but also related to the previous conversation is how you guys come up mm -hmm. with strategy for lupio so you mentioned uh ready to start before we start recording about you guys leaving for your for your annual retreat i'm just curious as to what, you know, how you guys set your, your priorities and how you go about creating them? I think um, for us, creating strategy has evolved over time. And really what it's important is empowering individuals that are leading different teams to help drive the strategy for the business. Um, so, you know, there's you always end up having a ton of data around, you know, how you're doing in terms of sales, what are your numbers for churn, uh, you know, what type of customers are the best customers for you. And we basically pull all that information and we think about what we have even from a capacity standpoint in terms of what we can achieve based on the number of team members that we have. Um, and we start going through those priorities and think about how we can drive the strategic initiatives for the business. For us, our strategic initiatives get broken down per quarter. So we always end up having quarterly goals and we segment them by team. And we also provide a single point of accountability for each and every goal. And at the end of the day, all of the goals in combination, they need to focus on the overall objective for the business. And for, for us right now, the primary sort of metric for us is driving recurring revenue for the company. So we really try to be um, thoughtful in terms of, is doing this going to add value? So for every goal, we actually note down um, what is the sort of value of action. And ideally, we can put a quantitative metric in, associated with that action. Uh, and then what is the cost of inaction? So what happens if we don't hit that goal? What is that going to cost the organization in terms of resources, uh, time, and even potentially exposing business risk? Um, so... I think that's those are the main elements that are important for us from a goal setting perspective. Um, but you know, for us, for strategy overall for the business, um, something else that we do as a team, at least for, as a founding team, um, we do monthly uh, strategic offsites. So every single month, me, Zach, and Matt step away from the organization completely. We uh, have a, a separate room or an office that we book outside. So we'll use something like Breather, for example, to book a to book an external office, um, and we will have an agenda for that day in terms of three to five strategic things that we want to focus on, and we just go ahead and start whiteboarding and thinking things through together. So we can then take those strategic insights and have action items coming from there, and then we bring them back to the team and drive things to the organization level as well. So it's really important that the communication funnels. So the rest of the organization and we don't operate in the silo of like, these are the founders coming up with their ideas and then the organization is something else. We are very much integrated and the goal is to not have this sort of differentiation 
a founder, non-founder, which I think is a very dangerous thing when you have founders who may operate with a chip on their shoulder or they believe that their strategic thinking is more evolved or is going to uh, or is not open to criticism. And I think that's something that's important is that we need to make ourselves available to be criticized and to receive feedback. Yeah, that's great. And do you allow the team to not only challenge, but to propose strategic priorities? Uh, where How do you draw Absolutely. the line? Absolutely. I think uh, going back to sort of the quarterly goal setting, every sort of leader of each team is responsible for identifying a certain number of goals for each quarter. And that requires that leader of that team to sit with everyone else within that particular team to go through all the different initiatives and everyone has a chance to propose different things to work on. And, you know, it, it becomes a sort of uh, discussion and a debate in terms of what is really a strategic goal. Um, but there could be other initiatives that happen that are just simply considered as sort of smaller projects that are prioritized more on the team level. Uh, and then the strategic objectives are actually communicated company-wide and are tracked and reviewed on a regular basis across the organization. No, that's really interesting. I really like the concept of these like monthly uh, get-togethers. Like we, you know, we look at doing monthly sprints, uh, but it's also mm -hmm. you guys go a few levels deeper, which I find very interesting. Um, Want to be yeah. respectful of your time, Jafar? Maybe one, uh, one or two more last questions. What, sure. what feeds into those strategic planning sessions? More of a question in terms of what are you keeping your eye on in the industry? Is it particular trends or technologies or, uh, or different aspects that are changing? Um, so just curious as to what's preoccupying your mind right now. Um, I, well, I can speak to right now in terms of the things I, I'm, I'm focusing on in the meantime, I think a lot of the initiatives, um, and, I, and I you know, mentioned this a few times already during this conversation, go back to people. So I think for us, you know, we're really growing the team at a very rapid pace. Uh, you know, we're, we're near 50 people today, and our plans are to double that by the end of this year. So the things that really come top of mind for me are, you know, what are the particular needs in terms of the different roles that we're hiring. And, and we've already outlined a lot of those. Um, but the, the challenge becomes, you know, how do we onboard people in a, the most productive way possible? Um, how are we going to scale certain processes? So for me as, as the COO, uh, some of my core responsibilities are around finance and operations. So I think about a lot of those elements or processes that we put in place that worked really well for, you know, 30 people, but, you know, how are they going to work for a hundred people? So, you know, th those are some of the conversations that we have. It's not necessarily around scaling the platform or technology related discussions, but more around how do we scale elements of what we're doing as an organization and scale them as the team grows. Um, other conversations that we end up having are in relation to our general roadmap for our product. Um, so we've stuck very firm in terms of um, our offering. We started as an organization that helps companies respond to RFPs, and we've been very much laser focused on that. And it's, it's, I think it's pretty unique that we haven't necessarily had to pivot. Uh, we have had some expansion in terms of the different things that we do, but we need to continue to be aware of what our product is doing, how that product's going to evolve, and, you know, what are we going to do as we step, you know, two years into the future? How do we look at things like the overall ecosystem of software solutions that our customers are using and how do we fit in? So, for example, uh, many companies, integrations are extremely important, especially as you sell to the enterprise. If your solution is not able to talk to some of the other core solutions that an organization is using, then you're creating a silo. So our goal as a software company is how do we break those silos and make sure that we're able to be a solution that is being used in, um, in conjunction with the rest of the technology stack that our customers are using and basically be so uh, engaging and so helpful as a software solution that you'd basically need to rip it out of their hands if, if you're, like, you'd struggle to take it away from them. Uh, an example that our um, CEO, Zach, would say is like, 
you basically want it so that if someone wanted to take your solution away from a customer or a user at the customer, that there would be riots. Uh, not to say that there's anything violent or anything associated with that, but just ima- imagine taking Salesforce away from a salesperson and what that would do to an organization. And that's really our vision for Lupio as well. That's uh, very admirable. I really like, <laughs> I like the example of like, you have to rip it out of their cold dead hands before they accept. Yeah. Um, uh, Jafar, I really appreciate your time and I found that you had some really great insights. Um, I, maybe one last question. Where can people find out more about Lupio and about what you guys are doing? Uh, you can uh, always hit us up and check out our website, which is www.lupio.com, which is L-O-O-P-I-O.com. Uh, and, you know, for us, our biggest point of focus, as I mentioned, is is around people. So if anyone's interested to learn about the great career opportunities that we have here at the organization, they can go to lupio.com slash careers. And we're looking for people in all different facets, you know, uh, and all different levels as well. So very excited to grow the team with amazing people. And uh, hopefully this uh, is a chance for people to learn a bit more about us and what we care about. Amazing. Make sure to spread the good word then. Thanks so much. Jafar, thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Nectar. Thank you for listening to the Point of No Return podcast. Never miss an episode by clicking on the subscribe button on iTunes or Google Play. 